La biología molecular estudia las moléculas que forman a los seres vivos. El ADN es la molécula más importante de un organismo. Durante años, el hombre ha estudiado el ADN a fin de conocer las miles de funciones que cumple y poder generar soluciones para múltiples problemas, y no solo biológicos. Tanto avanzó la investigación, que hoy en día aparece en escena una nueva técnica del estudio del ADN, menos compleja y mucho más eficaz, CRISPR-Cas9. Para hablar de esta técnica, hoy en Talking Tech, Omar Coso charla con Kevin Svelte, director del grupo Sculpting Evolution, que usa CRISPR-Cas9 para estudiar y potenciar ecosistemas. Hi Kevin, it's a pleasure to have you here. We understand you are a PhD from Harvard and now you are an MIT professor. It's a very great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. We were wondering, when did your interest in science show up for the first time? Science was, I don't even know when, I can't remember not being interested in science. But my interest in, in life and how life evolves arose from when I was 10 years old. I was fortunate and my parents took me to the Galapagos Islands. Uh -huh. And seeing the incredible, bewildering variety of different living things there, where it's so obvious how they're related because they're so similar and yet different, mm -hmm. that I just became fascinated with the works of Darwin. And so I began reading everything that Darwin wrote. Uh -huh. And I resolved that I wanted to learn how to sculpt living things that beautiful. So you had this wonderful experience at the Galapagos Islands, and uh, you saw the variety of species that live there. You focused for your research on molecular biology. How do we connect working on molecular biology or biochemistry to biological diversity? Well, I actually think of myself as an evolutionary engineer because I'm interested in studying evolution, but in particular, I'm interested in working with evolution to evolve new DNA sequences that correspond to new traits in organisms. So you're interested in evolution, you call yourself an uh, evolution engineer. That means that somehow you're intervening on evolution. How is that? Well, evolution is a, it's like a, a law of physics. In fact, there, there are some people that believe it's a, it is a natural outgrowth of the law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. that living organisms are patterns. And being made of information, in this case written in DNA, you have variation when these patterns replicate. Mm -hmm. And those patterns that are best at replicating become more abundant. Yes. And that's almost an iron law of how our universe works. It is this blind physical process that can create incredible beauty, but also incredible sorrow. Yes, that's a wonderful concept. So, and when you say that you're intervening on uh, evolution, you have a project called Sculpting Evolution, am I right? That's, what, that's the name of my research group. Perfect, and the, why did you choose that name? Because as I see it, evolution is a wondrous process because we don't have to understand something in order to use evolution mm -hmm. to shape it. And that's important because things that have evolved are famously difficult to understand. Yes. If you take this, the smallest biomolecules, just the product of a single gene encoding one protein, we still can't use computers to predict how that protein will fold and what it will do. Mm -hmm. But if we create a billion variants and we test them all and we select for the one that does what we want best, and then we create a billion variants of that one and we do it again and again and again, then even though we don't understand how it folds into a shape, how it catalyzes a particular molecular activity, mm -hmm. we can still create a new molecule that does what we want. So you might say that evolution is a black box and we can put something in and see what comes and we can turn the and we can and we can set the dials and something will come out that is different. We don't understand how it did it. Mm -hmm. But it can still create 
useful tools. So this is what I mean by harnessing evolution. We need to shape the environment mm -hmm. so as to select for the properties that we want. Perfect. When, when you refer to the name of your group, Sculpting Evolution, you uh, usually are connecting with the word of an artist, of a sculpture. Sculptures have tools, specific tools. Which are your tools? I would say that biotechnology has mm -hmm. four main tools. Those are the ability to replicate DNA, okay. the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, as we call it. The ability to read DNA, to sequence the different bases in DNA. Mm -hmm. The ability to write DNA, to create DNA of any given sequence. Yes. And the ability to edit DNA in a living organism. That is, to change the existing sequence to a new one, but within a cell. And for that last purpose, we most commonly use CRISPR. What is CRISPR? It's best thought of as a molecular scalpel that can be programmed to recognize in the incredibly vast genome of billions of bases, it can recognize a sequence of just 20 base pairs that is unique out of billions. It will find that one sequence and it will bind there. Yes, and? And if we want to edit that sequence, we use CRISPR to cut the DNA because it's a molecular scalpel. And when DNA is cut, the cell needs to fix it. And its preferred way of fixing it is to find a sequence that is very similar, which is usually the other chromosome because we have two copies of most genes. Uh -huh. But if we introduce a new sequence, then sometimes it will use ours mm -hmm. as the template for repair. And so it will copy our sequence in place of the original. So CRISPR, because it lets us precisely cut any sequence, and it works in every organism, as best we can tell, throughout all the kingdoms of life, then as long as we can deliver CRISPR and DNA into the cells that will give rise to an organism, we can edit and therefore learn to understand the function of any gene in any organism. How long has the technique been available? less than five years. And in how many organisms has it been used so far? Hundreds, possibly. Hundreds, possibly thousands. Hundreds, possibly? Definitely hundreds. I don't know if it's over a thousand yet, but I would not be surprised. The CRISPR technique has allowed you to edit genes in a microorganism confined in a plastic device in one of your laboratories. However, when we read your work, we read something like designing tools to remodel ecosystems. How do we go from organisms in a tissue dish or to ecosystems out there? Well, that is a great question, and it all comes down to natural selection. Mm -hmm. Because when we engineer an organism, it doesn't matter if it's through selective breeding, as mm -hmm. in turning wolves into dogs, mm -hmm. or using CRISPR, we're changing it for our benefit, not for the benefit of the organism. So Darwin said, man selects for his own good, nature for that of the being which she tends. Mm -hmm. And what that means is when we are altered organisms put out in the wilderness, are eliminated. They don't do as well as wild organisms. And that's why we can't use biology to alter ecosystems, or at least not until recently. Mm -hmm. Because suppose instead of using CRISPR just to cut a gene and replace it with a new version, suppose you insert the new version and the instructions for making CRISPR and telling it to make that change. Then you have an organism that has the ability to do genome editing on its own. Mm -hmm. If that organism mates with a wild organism, then the offspring will inherit one new version and one original. And the CRISPR system will cut the original version and replace it with the new version and a copy of itself. So genome editing just happened in the offspring without any humans involved. Yes. Then now that offspring has two copies of the new version, 
And so when it mates with a wild organism, its offspring are guaranteed to inherit, and editing happens again. Yes. You can think of it as a find and replace that has been released into the population that finds the original version of the gene and replaces it with the new version. And even if the new version doesn't help the organism reproduce, it's getting inherited more often than it would otherwise. You said seconds ago, without human intervention, without human intervention directly, but it's a consequence of what humans did on the first step. That's right. Okay, and this brings us to uh, the issue of working safely, of safety in the, the, uh, our sport of practicing science. What can you tell us about? Well, and it's also a matter of ethics because if you're doing biology in the lab and you know that pretty much no matter what you do, if it flies out the window, it's not going to have any effect in the environment, then you're pretty safe. You can do what you like. But if you're running an experiment where you think there is a good chance that if released, it will spread in the wild, potentially changing things, mm -hmm. that's another story. Because we all depend on shared ecosystems. Yes. You can't opt out of needing to breathe the air and drink the water and eat food. Mm -hmm. So if you perform an experiment that is intended or even might accidentally affect the environment, then you're making a decision that could affect other people sure. without letting them have any voice in that decision. Yes. So it's for that reason that I don't think we can do this kind of research, mm -hmm. which this cutting and copying mechanism is a form of what's called gene drive. Mm -hmm. It's ubiquitous in nature. Evolution invented it. Yes. But with CRISPR, we can harness it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we should do that behind closed doors. And that's a problem because almost all science is done behind closed doors. And how can we do to prevent someone from attempting that? You have to change the incentives governing how scientists do research. Uh -huh. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh -huh. But this is a great place to start just because to me, at least, it seems so obvious that we should not be denying people a choice in what the environment will be like in the future. If we're going to change it, we need to make it clear what we're proposing and invite people to tell us what they think is wrong with that. So your work has a strong element in molecular biology, but also has a strong, strong element to work on social awareness, let's say. What's going on about that? What are your plans? Well, I think that the way that we currently do science, behind closed doors, trying to solve problems that we think are problems, mm -hmm. in the way that we think is best, usually doesn't go out there and ask people who are having problems if that really is the problem. Mm. That is, we just assume that we know best. When in reality, if you want to know how to solve an ecological problem, you need to go to the community who lives there and say, is this a problem? How do you want it solved? We can do this, or we can do this, or we can do this. And we haven't started any of them yet. Okay. Because there is no point unless you want to do it. Because you're the people who live here. You know the environment best. And nothing can happen unless you want to do it. So I think of this as open and responsive science, okay. in which the community is in the driver's seat, because you go to the community and say, what do you want? We will be the technical hands. You will tell us what to do. Do we have already any examples in which that community participation in helping you design your research has already started? Or do you have plans for the near future? So we've begun a pilot project in the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, which are off the coast of Massachusetts near Boston. And there, the problem is disease spread by ticks. Mm -hmm. Something like 40% of the citizens of Nantucket 
have been impacted by tick-borne disease. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous problem. And it's a problem because we inadvertently change the environment to maximize the number of infected ticks. Mm -hmm. That's because we like forests. Mm -hmm. We like living in the forest, but we also like having roads and houses yeah. in the forest, which creates lots of forest boundaries. Yes, of course. And that favors deer, which the ticks feed on, and it favors white-footed mice, which they also feed on. Uh -huh. So ticks bite several times. They typically bite a mouse, a mouse, and then a deer, and then, uh, then they lay eggs. Uh -huh. So more mice and more deer means more ticks. Mm -hmm. More ticks means more disease transmission from mouse to mouse, because a tick that bites a mouse that is infected with a pathogen, the tick gets infected. Mm -hmm. Then it bites another mouse, it infects that mouse. Okay. Problem is, when the tick bites a person, then we get disease. So the idea is, why not immunize all of the mice so that they can't get sick? Okay. And how can you do that? Well, the mice develop immunity on their own over time, just like we do. Yes. Some, some days after we first start getting sick, we start to get better. And that's because our adaptive immune system has begun evolving antibody genes that can recognize the pathogen and destroy it. The mice do the same thing. The problem is that kind of immunity isn't passed down to our offspring. So what we thought we could do was to identify antibodies from the mice mm -hmm. that have been exposed and become immune either to the pathogens or to the ticks themselves. Because you can develop an immune response to a tick bite that causes the tick to fall off after it tries to bite you. Okay. So the idea is, let's identify the antibody genes that confer that kind of protection. And then if we use CRISPR to insert that into the genome of the mouse, but into the reproductive cells, so it will be passed on to future generations, mm -hmm. then that could confer immunity on the entire population of mice going down into the future. And this has not been done before. Mm -hmm. We were reasonably certain that we could do it. Okay. But we felt that it was important to go to the community before doing anything, before asking for money, and Did say... You talk to the community, did the community approve? Did you get funding for that? And are you practicing it, this already? That's right. So we went to the community and said, what do you want? And they said, yes, we want you to at least begin research on this. We're not promising that we're going to say yes and release okay. mice, but we want you to begin research, mm -hmm. and we want you to make them immune to both the pathogens and the ticks mm -hmm. to try to block all of the diseases. Mm -hmm. So that's why the project is now called Mice Against Ticks, because we are enlisting the mice to fight the ticks. Okay. <laughs> Is there any opportunity you are interested in applying some of your projects to the environment in Argentina? Well, I am fascinated to see what the citizens of Argentina will decide to do. Because I think you have an opportunity to define humanity's relationship with the natural world. The question is, do we have a moral obligation to intervene in nature to relieve animal suffering. Mm -hmm. Because here in South America, you have a species called the New World Screwworm. Cochleomyia hominivorax is the scientific name, the man devourer. Mm -hmm. And it lays its eggs in open wounds, and the larvae eat the animal alive. Oh. It's excruciatingly painful, mm -hmm. and it's an intrinsic part of the life cycle. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect example of how evolution has no moral compass. It cares nothing for suffering. I see. But now, we can do something about the screw worm. It's, in fact, already been eradicated from North America mm -hmm. by means of what's called the sterile insect technique. Mm -hmm. If you raise lots of screw worms, 
their, the fly form and you irradiate them, then they become sterile. If you release millions and millions of sterile screwworm flies, they will mate with the wild ones, and then there won't be any offspring. And so you can eliminate screwworm from the area. So it's been eradicated from all of North America and, made, and kept in South America by releasing sterile screwworm flies constantly in Panama. Uh -huh. But that technique isn't powerful enough for South America. Why? My understanding is the geography is just too varied. Uh -huh. And the environment is better suited to screwworm. The population density is higher. But this gene drive technique that I mentioned using CRISPR, one of the things you can do if you're altering a population is you can spread infertility. You can ensure that two organisms that carry the gene drive system, when they mate, their offspring will be sterile. This should allow the complete removal of the screwworm from the wild. Mm -hmm. But if released anywhere, it would spread on its own throughout all the screwworm populations in the world throughout mm -hmm. South America. Mm -hmm. So it's only something that can be done with international cooperation among all the peoples of South America. So I think if this is going to happen, then it's the people here in Buenos Aires and Argentina that would need to lead the way. Okay. The, the diplomatic effort, the public discussion, is this something that we should do? Because it's a moral question. Mm -hmm. Are we obligated to intervene? Because I think most of us would agree if we are walking along the shore of a lake and there is a child we see drowning in the lake, we are obligated to jump in, swim, and rescue the child. Yes. That's true, even if we didn't throw the child in the lake. Of course. But we're only obligated to do it if we know how to swim. Otherwise, we, we cannot rescue the child. Mm -hmm. With the development of technologies like CRISPR gene drive, we have now done the equivalent of learning how to swim. We now could intervene to remove the screwworm from the wild. Mm -hmm. We would not have to drive it extinct. We can maintain it in the laboratory on just dead meat broth that would not harm any animal. Mm -hmm. It would also be of tremendous economic benefit simply because the screwworm is terrible in particular for cattle, sheep, yes, goats, yes, sure. any mammal. But I'm interested in this animal welfare question. Should we intervene in nature to solve a problem of horrific cruelty to animals? Yes. Is that our responsibility? Because now that we have learned how to swim, we are responsible for whatever we choose. Mm -hmm. So what will the people of Argentina decide? I can tell you that will happen. And is that a problem for human health too? It is on occasion. Um, there definitely are people who can become infested. This is how we know just how painful it is, they can tell us. But it's not a major human health hazard. Usually if, if noticed, then it can be quickly treated. Mm -hmm. So it would not be largely for human health, although that would be a minor benefit. Reading your papers, it's obvious that you have developed a strong and conceptually solid tools to work inside the lab. Knowing you personally, it shows that you have a high sense of humanity, of what should we be doing as scientists outside the lab relating to communities and to the rest of the world. So can you tell us about your plans expanding that part of your activities? Well, I believe very strongly that we as scientists should hold ourselves morally responsible for all the consequences of our work. Mm -hmm. And science really works by inviting others to prove us wrong. The problem now is that we really only invite other scientists to prove us wrong, and only after we've done the work. Yes. I think we should broaden that. I think we should invite everyone to prove us wrong okay. from the very beginning of a proposal, even to develop a technology that might change the world. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice to young students starting to work in biochemistry, molecular biology, ecology? 
follow your passion, but always think, what problem should you be trying to solve? And in order to answer that question, talk to other people and see what they care about and how you might be able to help. Kevin, thank you very much for visiting Argentina and for taking your time talking to us. So it's been a real pleasure. The pleasure is mine, and I very much look forward to seeing what the people of Argentina decide to do. Thank you.